This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Michael Scherer. Typee by Herman Melville. Chapter 1 Six months at sea. Yes, reader, as I live, six months out of sight of land cruising after the sperm whale beneath the scorching sun of the line, and tossed on the billows of the wide-rolling Pacific. The sky above, the sea around, and nothing else. Weeks and weeks ago our fresh provisions were all exhausted. There is not a sweet potato left, not a single yam. Those glorious bunches of bananas which once decorated our stern and quarter-deck have, alas disappeared. And the delicious oranges which hung suspended from our tops and stays, they too are gone. Yes, they are all departed, and there is nothing left us but salt horse and sea biscuit. Oh, ye stateroom sailors, who make so much ado about a fourteen days passage across the Atlantic, who so pathetically relate the privations and hardships of the sea, where after a day of breakfasting, lunching, dining off five courses, chatting, playing whist, and drinking champagne punch, it was your hard lot to be shut up in little cabinets of mahogany and maple, and sleep for ten hours, with nothing to disturb you but those good-for-nothing tars shouting and tramping overhead. What would ye say to our six months out of sight of land? Oh, for a refreshing glimpse of one blade of grass, for a snuff at the fragrance of a handful of the loamy earth. Is there nothing fresh around us? Is there no green thing to be seen? Yes, the inside of our bulwarks is painted green, but what a vile and sickly hue it is, as if nothing bearing even the semblance of verdure could flourish this weary way from land. Even the bark that once clung to the wood we use for fuel has been gnawed off and devoured by the captain's pig, and so long ago, too, that the pig himself has in turn been devoured. There is but one solitary tenant in the chicken coop, once a gay and dapper young cock, bearing him so bravely among the coy hens. But look at him now. There he stands, moping all the day long on that everlasting one leg of his, he turns with disgust from the moldy corn before him, and the brackish water in his little trough. He mourns, no doubt, his lost companions, literally snatched from him one by one, and never seen again. But his days of mourning will be few, for Mungo, our black cook, told me yesterday that the word had at last gone forth, and poor Pedro's fate was sealed. His attenuated body will be laid out upon the captain's table next Sunday, and long before night will be buried with all the usual ceremonies beneath that worthy individual's vest. Who would believe that there could be anyone so cruel as to long for the decapitation of the luckless Pedro? Yet the sailors pray every minute, selfish fellows, that the miserable fowl may be brought to his end. They say the captain will never point the ship for the land, so long as he has in anticipation a mess of fresh meat. This unhappy bird can alone furnish it, and when he is once devoured, the captain will come to his senses. I wish thee no harm, Peter, but as thou art doomed, sooner or later, to meet the fate of all thy race, and if putting a period to thy existence is to be the signal for our deliverance, why, truth to speak, I wish thy throat cut this very moment, for oh how I wish to see the living earth again. The old ship herself longs to look out upon the land from her hawse holes once more, and Jack Lewis said right the other day, when the captain found fault with his steering. Why do you see, Captain Vangs? says bold Jack. I'm as good a helmsman as ever put hand to spoke, but none of us can steer the old lady now. We can't keep her full and by, sir. Watch her ever so close, she will fall off, and then, sir, when I put the helm down so gently and try to coax her to the work, she won't take it kindly, but will fall round off again, and it's all because she knows the land is under the lee, sir, and she won't go any more to windward. 
Ay, and why should she, Jack? Didn't every one of her stout timbers grow on shore, and hasn't she sensibilities as well as we? Poor old ship. Her very looks denote her desires. How deplorably she appears. The paint on her sides, burnt up by the scorching sun, is puffed out and cracked. See the weeds she trails along with her, and what an unsightly bunch of those horrid barnacles has formed about her sternpiece. And every time she rises on a sea, she shows her copper torn away, or hanging in jagged strips. Poor old ship. I say again, for six months she has been rolling and pitching about, never for one moment at rest. But courage, old lass, I hope to see thee soon within a biscuit's toss of the merry land, riding snugly at anchor in some green cove, and sheltered from the boisterous winds. Hurrah, my lads, it's a settled thing. Next week we shape our course to the Marquesas. The Marquesas? What strange visions of outlandish things does the very name spirit up? Naked houris, cannibal banquets, groves of coconut, coral reefs, tattooed chiefs, and bamboo temples, sunny valleys planted with breadfruit trees, carved canoes dancing on the flashing blue waters, savage woodlands guarded by horrible idols, heathenish rites, and human sacrifices. Such were the strangely jumbled anticipations that haunted me during our passage from the cruising ground. I felt an irresistible curiosity to see those islands, which the olden voyagers had so glowingly described. The group for which we were now steering, although among the earliest of European discoveries in the South Seas, having been first visited in the year 1595, still continues to be tenanted by beings as strange and barbarous as ever. The missionaries, sent on a heavenly errand, had sailed by their lovely shores, and had abandoned them to their idols of wood and stone. How interesting the circumstances under which they were discovered. In the watery path of Mendanya, cruising in quest of some region of gold, these isles had sprung up like a scene of enchantment, and for a moment the Spaniard believed his bright dream was realized. In honor of the Marques de Mendoza, then viceroy of Peru, under whose auspices the navigator sailed, he bestowed upon them the name which denoted the rank of his patron, and gave to the world on his return a vague and magnificent account of their beauty. But these islands, undisturbed for years, relapsed into their previous obscurity, and it is only recently that anything has been known concerning them. Once in the course of a half-century, to be sure, some adventurous rover would break in upon their peaceful repose, and astonished at the unusual scene, would be almost tempted to claim the merit of a new discovery. Of this interesting group, but little account has ever been given, if we accept the slight mention made of them in the sketches of South Sea voyages. Cook, in his repeated circumnavigations of the globe, barely touched at their shores, and all that we know about them is from a few general narratives. Among these there are two that claim particular notice. Porter's Journal of the Cruise of the U.S. Frigate Essex in the Pacific during the late war is said to contain some interesting particulars concerning the islanders. This is a work, however, which I have never happened to meet with. And Stewart, the chaplain of the American sloop of war Vincennes, has likewise devoted a portion of his book, entitled A Visit to the South Seas, to the same subject. Within the last few years, American and English vessels engaged in the extensive whale fisheries of the Pacific have occasionally, when short of provisions, put into the commodious harbor, which there is in one of the islands, but a fear of the natives, founded on a recollection of the dreadful fate which many white men have received at their hands, has deterred their crews from intermixing with the population sufficiently to gain any insight into their peculiar customs and manners. The Protestant missions appear to have despaired of reclaiming these islands from heathenism. The usage they have in every case received from the natives has been such as to intimidate the boldest of their number. Ellis, in his Polynesian researches, gives some interesting accounts of the abortive attempts made by the Tahiti mission to establish a branch mission upon certain islands of the group. 
a short time before my visit to the Marquesas, a somewhat amusing incident took place in connection with these efforts, which I cannot avoid relating. An intrepid missionary, undaunted by the ill success that had attended all previous endeavors to conciliate the savages, and believing much in the efficacy of female influence, introduced among them his young and beautiful wife, the first white woman who had ever visited their shores. The islanders at first gazed in mute admiration at so unusual a prodigy, and seemed inclined to regard it as some new divinity. But after a short time, becoming familiar with its charming aspect, and jealous of the folds which encircled its form, they sought to pierce the sacred veil of calico in which it was enshrined, and in the gratification of their curiosity so far overstepped the limits of good breeding, as deeply to offend the lady's sense of decorum. Her sex, once ascertained, their idolatry was changed into contempt, and there was no end to the contumely showered upon her by the savages, who were exasperated at the deception which they conceived had been practiced upon them. To the horror of her affectionate spouse, she was stripped of her garments, and given to understand that she could no longer carry on her deceits with impunity. The gentle dame was not sufficiently evangelized to endure this, and, fearful of further improprieties, she forced her husband to relinquish his undertaking, and together they returned to Tahiti. Not thus shy of exhibiting her charms was the island queen herself the beauteous wife of Moana, the king of Nukahiva. Between two and three years after the adventures recorded in this volume, I chanced, while aboard of a man of war, to touch at these islands. The French had then held possession of the Marquesas some time, and already prided themselves upon the beneficial effects of their jurisdiction, as discernible in the deportment of the natives. To be sure, in one of their efforts at reform, they had slaughtered about a hundred and fifty of them at Wittahoo, but let that pass. At the time I mentioned, the French squadron was rendezvousing in the Bay of Nukahiva, and during an interview between one of their captains and our worthy Commodore, it was suggested by the former that we, as the flagship of the American squadron, should receive in state a visit from the royal pair. The French officer likewise represented, with evident satisfaction, that under their tuition the king and queen had imbibed proper notions of their elevated station, and on all ceremonious occasions conducted themselves with suitable dignity. Accordingly, preparations were made to give their majesties a reception on board in a style corresponding with their rank. One bright afternoon, a gig, gaily bedizened with streamers, was observed to shove off from the side of one of the French frigates and pull directly for our gangway. In the stern sheets reclined Moana and his consort. As they approached, we paid them all the honors due to royalty, manning our yards, firing a salute, and making a prodigious hubbub. They ascended the accommodation ladder, were greeted by the commodore, hat in hand, and passing along the quarter deck, the marine guard presented arms, while the band struck up the King of the Cannibal Islands. So far all went well. The French officers grimaced and smiled in exceedingly high spirits, wonderfully pleased with the discreet manner in which these distinguished personages behaved themselves. Their appearance was certainly calculated to produce an effect. His Majesty was arrayed in a magnificent military uniform, stiff with gold lace and embroidery, while his shaven crown was concealed by a huge chapeau bras, waving with ostrich plumes. There was one slight blemish, however, in his appearance. A broad patch of tattooing stretched completely across his face, in a line with his eyes, making him look as if he wore a huge pair of goggles, and royalty in goggles suggested some ludicrous ideas. But it was in the adornment of the fair person of his dark-complexioned spouse that the tailors of the fleet had evinced the gaiety of their national taste. She was habited in a gaudy tissue of scarlet cloth, trimmed with yellow silk, which, descending a little below the knees, exposed to view her bare legs, embellished with spiral tattooing, and somewhat resembling two miniature Trajan's columns. Upon her head was a fanciful turban of purple velvet, figured with silver sprigs, and surmounted by a tuft of variegated feathers. The ship's company, crowding into the gangway to view the sight, 
soon arrested her majesty's attention. She singled out from their number an old salt, whose bare arms and feet and exposed breast were covered with as many inscriptions in India ink as the lid of an Egyptian sarcophagus. Notwithstanding all the sly hints and remonstrances of the French officers, she immediately approached the man, and pulling further open the bosom of his duck frock, and rolling up the leg of his wide trousers, she gazed with admiration at the bright blue and vermilion pricking, thus disclosed to view. She hung over the fellow, caressing him, and expressing her delight in a variety of wild exclamations and gestures. The embarrassment of the polite Gauls at such an unlooked-for occurrence may be easily imagined, but picture their consternation when all at once the royal lady, eager to display the hieroglyphics on her own sweet form, bent forward for a moment and, turning sharply round, threw up the skirts of her mantle and revealed a sight from which the aghast Frenchmen retreated precipitately, and, tumbling into their boat, fled the scene of so shocking a catastrophe.' 